Hola. <laughs> Just came to me. Hi, this is Jen Grant, and you're Hi, listening. Hi, this is Graham K. Hi, you were listening. This is Adam Fox, and you're listening. This to is the... Dylan Mandelson, and you're listening to the. This is Brian Hat, and you are listening to the Julian. Hi, this is the word man <laughs> of Alcatraz. Señores, señores. Hey, everybody, this is little Darren Frost. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Mi nombre es Fabio Mantovan, y están escuchando a Julian Dion. This is Dave Sidhu, and you're listening to the Julian Dion Comedy Podcast. Podcast hour. <laughs> <You're good. Time>. <laughs> okay. Showcase. <laughs> you are listening to the Julian Dion. On Comedy Hour podcast. Hola. Up. Welcome to episode 21 of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour podcast. That's right. 21 episodes. It's a serious shit. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. My guest today, Jason Fraser of Fraser Studios. Actor, acting coach, teacher, trainer. He's a Meisner-trained actor, and uh, we get into a little bit of uh, what makes the man, the man behind the myth. Is he a myth? Is it a myth? Am I using that properly? I don't think I'm using that properly. Jason Fraser, we have a good chat, and uh, he's actually my teacher. I'm taking his classes, with that I've, the Meisner classes that I've mentioned before in previous monologues. Anyway, we'll get into that in a little bit. Jason Fraser, everybody, will be in studio. I'm feeling uh, a little... Oh, by the way, happy Thanksgiving to uh, my American listeners. Happy Thanksgiving weekend, y'all. Hope you enjoy and have a good one. I'm feeling under the weather. I've got uh, a little bit of a throat thing happening, a little cold. Feverish, kinda. Not feeling too well. Two, two uh, things are ailing me. Uh, that a little cold and flu. Tis the season, and I have a um, pimple in my belly button, which is extre- extremely painful. Believe it or not. Anyway, uh, I'm I'm falling apart right here. But I had to uh, had to do this intro. This is my first. Sick intro, I think. I actually had to miss Jason's class yesterday because I, cause I feel like shite. He's trying to get back on my feet. Anyway, it's a good episode. You're going to enjoy it. Despite my belly button pain. That's deceivingly more painful than it sounds. Zit in belly button. I equate it to the new, uh, to the male equivalent of childbirth. Used to be kidney stones, they would say. Now, uh, no, scr- scratch that. Belly button pimple. That's where it's at. Any hoozle. What else is going on? I've been reading a self-help book. Yep. I admit it. I've been reading a good one. Actually, I've owned it for many years. And I got into it a few years back. And then I just sort of uh, started reading it again. It's called The Master Key System which would suggest that I attracted this cold and this belly button pimple into my life in one way or another. It's a really good one. It was actually written in the early 20th century, like 1915 or something like that. So it's old ideas. And in the book, there's two versions of uh, the book. There's one written in that, 
that era's language, the English, is a bit different, and one edited version, so it's like new English, with terms like turned up in it. Not actually, but it is actually uh, updated, but I'm reading the old version. It's it's good. The master key system, get into it. See, I can... It's embarrassing to admit when you read uh, self-help, but uh, I can get into it a little bit, like first-hand self-help. And what I mean by that, first let me just say that we are, this generation, a bunch of pussies when you think about it. If you, because, you know, with uh, life coaches and self-help, like you go to chapters or Indigo and there's aisle upon aisle of self-help and self-healing books. They didn't have that back in the day. They didn't, and if they did, it was very sparse, those ideas and notion. And now it's all about, uh, we're just so soft, I feel. That wasn't, you couldn't re resort to that kind of, or refer to that kind of, uh, those resources back in the day. And I can, I can digest firsthand self-help, as I mentioned, I'm doing it. I'm reading a book right now. But what I can't stand is secondhand self-help. And what I mean by this is, like, so many people have have read, I mean, almost everybody has read enough about self-help to be mildly annoying about it at random times. Unsolicited self-help, secondhand self-help will is enough to just like catapult me into a state of rage. I don't know, I can't handle it. I just, like everyone's, and it's always your most fucked up friend too, that like he read The Secret like eight years ago and then he'll... He's always the first one to tell, if you're having a bad day, he'll be your f the first one to tell you, like, Julian, you really need to, uh, you know, learn to love yourself and live in the moment, you know? Really, you owe it to yourself. Live in the moment. I'm like, really, you're fucked up on MDMA right now. You legitimately concerned, you, legi you actually dated your second cousin for two weeks back in the day, and you're going to give me second help. Secondhand self-help. I, I just can't, I can't stand it. So keep it to yourselves and let just people discover it on their own and have their own relationship with it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I don't think it's any coincidence that the initials, the uh, the uh, acronym for secondhand self-help is shh, shh, shut up. But it is hard to uh, live in the moment. Having said all that, it is it's so it's so hard. It's one of the challenges uh, uh, of today. And and you know, I actually we uh, touch on this with uh, my guest Jason Fraser because he's a teacher and and expert on the Meisner technique of acting, which, as I mentioned in other podcasts, actually applies to regular life. It just teaches you how to lift the social veils and not be so self conscious all the time. And shift your focus outward and react on impulses and really learn to listen and be present and focus on what's happening. But that's so easier said than done. I went to a spa this week, a, a Nordic spa. It's kind of like uh, where you go hot, cold all day, you'll do, which might explain actually the, I'm just thinking of this right now, might explain the, the sore throat and cold, but it's kind of like, uh, you, so you go to this place all day, it's super relaxing, you go like, you go in a hot tub, steam room, or sauna first. You get to choose. It's all outside. And uh, then you go out of the hot tub. You do a, a Nordic plunge into uh, an ice-cold pool. And then you go in a hot room, not as hot as a sauna or anything, just like at 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And you just uh, you're, you relax for 15, 20 minutes and repeat the cycle. Go sauna, steam, or hot tub. Nordic plunge and relax. You do that all day, basically, and it's invigorating and relaxing, and it's great. But I was really trying to enjoy the moment, and it's so hard. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. We were sitting there in the hot tub, and there's, it was snowing. These great big snowflakes, and we're looking around. It's, a, it's actually, I'll give it a plug. It's a La Scandinave Spa and Resort at uh, Blue Mountain here in Ontario, two hours north of Toronto. It's great, and. Uh, Man, what what an experience. But again, I'm trying to take it in. I'm sitting there and I'm really trying to be present and then I'm realizing that it's, you know, it's a fleeting moment and then I get sad to the fact that it's fleeting and then I realize I'm not living in the moment. I'm already thinking of it being over. As soon as we got there, I started thinking of the next time we should get there. We should make that trip. We got there, I'm like, oh, we have to come. I'm already thinking of leaving. Can't even enjoy the moment. It's really, really hard. 
And uh, actually, I should give a shout out to Bailey, Allison, and Peter at the O&B restaurant at the Weston Trillium, in, which is in, uh, what's in it, Collingwood, which is where this place is, Blue Mountain and all that. Uh, yeah, just had a great night and great dinner and great, they treated us like royalty and it was amazing. So Peter, Bailey, and Allison at, let me get the real, the, the full name of the place. At the, the full name of the place is Oliver and Bonanik, Bonakini Restaurant. Oliver and Bon, <laughs> Oliver and Bonakini Restaurant. Bonacini? Bonakini. I don't know. I think Bonacini. Yeah, Bonacini. It's got to be. Oliver and Bonacini Restaurant there. Uh, just had a great, uh, great time. Anyway, live in the moment. Be present. As I'm talking into your ear holes right now, really just take it in. It's just you and I right now. It's just you and I. Anyway, like I said, I am a little sick, so I'm going to forego any uh, segments. I was going to read some emails and all that, but I just got to, just plowing through this monologue to uh, get the interview, get get to the interview. So let's, let's do that. Actually, before we do, just a couple plugs. Um, come to Say What next Wednesday, December 3rd for the Julian Dion Comedy Hour live show. We've got a good one lined up and Garage Baby will be there. It's a good time. It's the St. Lawrence area, downtown Toronto. It's at 67 Front Street East, 9 o'clock, Wednesday night. Come check that out. Also, Moncton, Monctonians, New Brunswick listeners, I'm coming to you uh, December 19th, which is a Friday with uh, Jen Grant, and we'll be performing at the Empress Theatre, and you can get your tickets now. Tickets are already selling pretty fast, so if you go to... uh, www.capital.nb.ca You can find the event there on Friday, December 19th, an evening of comedy with Julian Dion and Jen Grant. And so come check that out. Also, one more plug, plug any plug. Oh, go to the end of every episode for bloopers. If you haven't done so yet, there are bloopers at the end of each episode. So go back, go back a few episodes, choose one, and just skip all the way to the end for a little behind-the-scenes action. Ranging from 15 seconds to 30, 40 seconds. Some short, some long, but uh, have a little taste of uh, what it's like here at Lemon Press Studios before we turn on the mi- I guess the mics are turned on, but before we um, we go into the interviews. Okay, let's get to uh, speaking of which, let's get to my interview. Enjoy now my chat with uh, the very talented, the very gentle, the very effective and passionate Mr. Jason Fraser. This episode of the Julian Dion Comedy Hour, that's episode 21 with my guest Jason Fraser, is brought to you yet again by Echo One Photography, GTA, Toronto, Greater Toronto Area listeners, this one's for you. Again, if you're a comedian, actor, business person, musician, whoever, and you need to get some headshots done, well, go to Echo One Photography and they'll get you some damn good shots. Also, if you own a business and looking to get some product photography done for for e-commerce or advertising purposes... Echo One does that too. Greeting, uh, holiday greeting cards, Christmas cards that you would like to send out. Get some uh, professional shots done by Echo One. Email Eugene, that's E-U-G-E-N-E at echo1photography.com and enter J-D-C-H in the subject line. Do it today. You and me belong, just like the flowers, laughing all day long. People, I need to lose. Sing a little song, then take a shower. Julian Dion, comedy hour. Yeah, man, that's heavy duty. The thing, it, the thing with, uh, it's funny. I, I don't even know what to compare it to, really, in this world. Uh, learning lines is, I mean, it's like war. Like you do whatever you need to do mm-hmm. to survive, mm-hmm. right? You you if you need to fucking like oh are we allowed to like drop yeah. f bombs and oh, stuff? And fuck, oh, fuck or, yeah. or cunt, <laughs> <laughs> supreme <laughs> blasphemy, whatever. Yeah, anything you go goes. for it. This is this is the uh, the, the the JD comedy hour. Um, yeah, if you need to, you know, well, fuck it. Go for it. If you need to be raping chickens while <laughs> yeah. you're learning lines, if that's what does it for you, do it. then you do it. Yeah. You do it. I was, I have always been mental when it comes to learning lines. Anything shy of 1,000 times is like not, it, it fucks with my brain. If I do, yeah. if I say like a paragraph 999 times, 
I'll feel like I don't have it. Right, right. Yeah, and I just, yeah, it's crazy. And that makes all the difference in the world because if you have to think of your lines, it fucks everything up. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you need to know them. It's so That's important. True. And coming from a comedy background, by the way, let me just do a quick intro. This is, of course, you're listening to my guest here who sits in Lemon Press Studios across from me. Uh, he's a gentleman. He's a good man. He's an actor, a thespian, and a uh, teacher or coach. What what, what do you prefer? Uh, what's the term? Teacher? teacher coach? I'm, trainer? Uh, I'm, I'm liking coach more and more. Coach is good. Yeah. And it kind of, you're a sports guy, so it kind of fits. It kind of uh, fits. He's... Uh, uh, a coach of the Meisner Technique, which he has studied uh, at the prestigious Playhouse in New York City. He's one of the uh, sort of, he's from the generation, the grandchildren of Stanford Meisner uh, that have studied there. And we'll get into uh, a little bit of all of that. But Jason Fraser sits here with me today. Um, thanks again for doing this, bro. Thank you. My and friend, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is good. So let's uh, get into it. Yeah, we were just talking about uh, learning lines and. Um, Big, big brother of the information. Big brother of the information. What do you mean by that? Instead of coach or... or oh, big... <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yeah. <laughs> it just occurred to me now. All right. Yeah. Uh, knowledge uh, yeah. delivery engineer. It's a weird thing. Have you ever taught anything? Mm -mm. I can't say that I have. It, uh, uh, give it a shot. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, it's a strange thing. It's a it's a strange animal. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you because um, it sets up this dynamic instantly that you feel responsible for. Right. Right. And and you are in a way. I mean, well, totally. Yeah. yeah. As soon as somebody gives you money mm -hmm. for you to pass along knowledge to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> figure some shit out you got I, was, I, I always think of that when i'm in in your class yeah. by the way jason yeah. is uh, i'm in his class right now doing the meisner technique which i've talked about in a few monologues you've actually uh you may not know this but you've contributed to a few of my monologues so far uh the one about um listeners will recall the one about too much life and just wanting to retire go to retirement school oh man i got a lot of life <laughs> that comes from riffing with jason before class the other one was uh, teleportation i talked about which is a weird, <laughs> weird weird one i talked about it in a monologue yeah that one that, was great man i came from favorite. riffing with jason <laughs> and i had a full monologue about um being insecure or self-conscious mm -hmm. and how the Meisner technique sort of teaches you to, to transcend that and get remove the focus from yourself and focus outwardly mm -hmm. and i told a uh uh, a tale about uh, feeling self-conscious in your class. Mm -hmm. uh, I've directly talked about you without naming you, um, how... Uh, uh, he shall not be named. I felt self-conscious in your... It was like... this. This. The scenario was like you were giving a critique to someone and I had a question um, midway through uh, your critique, so I just <laughs> asked it, but you plowed through, which... I mean, you encourage just like if you have a question, just ask it. You don't yeah. have to raise your hand or wait. Just like yeah. <laughs> so, but you plowed through it. I felt so self conscious in that moment, and I did the awkward laugh we all do when you know, just like. <laughs> yeah. So, but no one even noticed that I had a question. But all of a sudden, I felt like, oh, everyone thinks I'm stupid now. <laughs> anyway, I talked about. I elaborated on that in a the whole funny, monologue. The funny thing is, no one was even paying attention to you. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the whole thing. But in that split yeah. second, the yeah. whole world is watching me. I of course. think. Yeah. And and. I just throw off that that little laugh. To, That's uh, the way it feels, right? Yeah. And then this little this little squirmy squeak of a of a laugh comes out for whatever reason, right? Yeah. But I often think about that in your class of like, there's an expectation to learn something from you. So people that are maybe having a harder time because it's simple work, but it's complex, as you described the Meisner technique, which we yep. will get into later on. Before we do, I want to get to know you a little bit more. Mm -hmm, sure. uh, but um, yeah, yeah, I think of that in your class where let's say some people may, may be, and this is fully my judgment, but may, maybe a little more behind the eight ball. Uh, and I think, shit, there, there's pressure on you to, like you said, deliver that knowledge. You got to bring it because they're paying you. Mm -hmm. And there's an expectation to learn. They pay for mm -hmm. a month and they think, okay, after this month, I'm going to know this. Mm -hmm. And that rests all on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. you, you will. So how do you sort of um, not think about that? Well, I mean, uh, and it did take a while. And once I, once I came uh, to this, uh, I guess, realization that uh, I've got the best security blanket mm -hmm. just cuddled right around me the whole time. 
And what I always say, and what because uh, I talked to other teachers as well, and, and which is really really helpful and great. Um, we all sort of agree that you know we're not reinventing the wheel here, right? And that's why you know uh, big brother of the information really does uh, play out because we're passing something along, right? Whereas Miser himself, I think, had uh, even greater burden in that. He was he he invented it, mm-hmm. you know. He was creating it, you know, uh, in the early going as it was as he was teaching it. A lot of trial and error, a lot of failure, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, for us uh, to, and I say this quite often, especially to myself, trying to sleep at night, uh, <laughs> defer to the technique, mm-hmm. the technique. Like I've studied it, I practiced with it. Um, I feel like I know it inside and out, um, you know as much as I can and it's there like it's there it, it really is a building block stepping stone um, uh, process and uh, you can defer to it so if I ever find um, or if I ever get into too much of a debate with a student um, I just take a look at what's what's my angle here what am I what am I trying to say and if it feels in a moment that um, it's a little bit too much personal opinion or what Jason Fraser would say here, then, uh, you know, take ego out of it mm-hmm. and cut straight to the technique. And it, um, it's very helpful because it's concrete. Right. And uh, you find and you'll see that, I mean, who's going who's gonna to look back at me and, and say, and, well, and if, the, if they do, if they look back at me in that moment and say, well, that's wrong or mm-hmm. I don't agree with that, I can, I can still say fine. You know, that's, that's, there's many paths to Rome. This is one uh, pretty concrete acting technique that uh, is designed to help you, mm-hmm. help actors. It takes commitment. It takes a lot of focus. It takes, uh, you know, the ups and downs within it. It's not a, I, I joke and I say, you know, there's no Meisner pill. You can't just right. <laughs> pop a Tic Tac and then all of a sudden you're, you're Meisner trained and you're glorious. But if you're willing to do the work, it's set up and designed to help you. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of people it's not for, and they walk out the door and that's fine. But the people that look back and they say, okay, you know what? I, I can see that your ego is out of this and you're not just trying to lay on, um, you know, you're better than I am or you know more. It, it It's like this side track basically that's there uh, to help us. You know, mm-hmm. we keep deferring to the technique, 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 and that's very helpful. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess when you put it that way, it's true. Mm-hmm. You you do have just facts to go by, yep. so it's not just uh, it's not mm-hmm. like you invented it, which that would be a whole other thing. And then I think, uh, yeah, exactly. And I think that um, you stick to sort of the guidelines that that the technique lays out, and then it's ours to experiment with, mm-hmm. and it's ours to sort of blow it up and uh, go through it, and and use like. It's crazy you, 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 you're taking some of this, so you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But you step into sort of the principles of the technique. Great. They're ideas. They're words that we say, right? But then when the whole training program is practical. So you take those concepts, and then you step right into it, and you live through it. You do it. You right. do the exercise work, right? And it, by doing that, exposes all these different things. Mm-hmm. And that, for me... I, that's what I love, mm-hmm. right? We defer to the technique. We have that to draw from. But then we step in and we actually do it. All this stuff, all the shit hits the fan. <laughs> all this stuff happens to us. And I just find it so fascinating. It's right? crazy. It is like uh, it is like therapy, um, the well, technique. A little bit, yeah. Because like you said, all, you uncover all this stuff. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll get into the specifics of that in a little bit. But first, uh, let us get to know uh, Jason a little bit. Oh, boy. So you're West... Uh, West Western guy West from side. Calgary. Calgary, Alberta, AB. And uh, when did you sort of realize you were going to be a drama guy? Uh, was that early on, your passion for acting? I feel like it was, it was quite late. Looking Let- back now, mm-hmm. my, um, my, my 35-year-old self, looking back now, uh, at, at a child, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically, when I started this. But at the time... I uh, I was in university at uh, the University of Calgary, miserable as mm-hmm. I think most of us were. What were you taking there? Um, general studies, <laughs> which I believe was an, a new degree mm. that they just offered, opened up that year, and uh, so many of us were like, "That sounds great." 
Yeah. Let's let's keep this experience uh, as general as possible. Right. <laughs> and I took I took every ology that they <laughs> offered. <Right. laughs> ten ten courses a year, man. Mm. Yeah, every ology they had, um, and, and uh, shocking. I was I was miserable. Didn't didn't mm. like any of it. Uh, well, except for this this one English class that I was in, which was which was great. It was an actual classroom. There was like maybe thirty of us or something in there, having discussions, reading Shakespeare, uh, you know, writing uh, essays on whatever thoughts that the professor had that day. Who was a bit of a kook, and and she was great. Um, but it was a lot more engaging and a lot more my style. And I think mm-hmm. that through that, I realized uh, very late that. Um, well, in my opinion, that I'm like, huh, I think there's something in this. I want to want to explore some of this stuff. And I went out and got myself into a couple of acting classes and and uh, into a few plays. And all of a sudden I had an agent and I'm like, this is weird. I don't know how to act. So and, then I had to go figure that out. And what's the reaction to that? I mean, coming from uh, Alberta, Calgary specifically, which is like the oil capital, the beef <laughs> uh, capital, sports sort stampede. of stampede, the yeah. cowboy capital. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem like a place that would be overly embracing of, of drama or acting. And given that you got into it so late, how do the people around you react to like, okay, I'm going to go do this guy and get in touch with my emotions, guys? Like, because yeah, like, you you are a sports guy too, right? Yeah. I mean, so you you sort of wore that hat for the first uh, quarter of your life. So how do you absolutely yeah. how do you not necessarily shed that, but sort of uh, bringing acting into people? Were you were people like, what the fuck are you doing? Sort of thing. Um, looking oh, good. absolutely. Yeah, right. I, I feel like that's pretty much across the board uh, for most. Most artists, mm-hmm. you know, um, the the minute you have that discussion with you know family, friends, or any, anyone in your inner circle, and you and you say you try to take it from from hobby, or um, sort of you know uh, side mm-hmm. passion to um, the forefront, and, and try to make it you boldly state, no, this is what I'm going to do. I think it's usually met with. Um, concern right uh you know the wide eyes of the three-headed monster looking back at you um i mean i have very supportive parents but even still every conversation still had that air of doubt and, right you know and fear and, and and all that stuff and then friends as well were, were a little more blunt about it in our it's life. amazing what people, sure? it's amazing what people will say to you in your mm-hmm. face too because yeah. i i can relate to that because i was a financial advisor mm-hmm. um when i quit everything for comedy like mm-hmm. short hair suit and tie <laughs> clean shaven <laughs> look at you now <laughs> right, that's right <laughs> complete 180 <laughs> complete 180 yeah. and i'm from a small town it's kind of it has it's kind of the opposite of calgary like it's not mm-hmm. the capital of anything but it's a small town it's not very artistically supportive and <laughs> so a job like financial advisor that's at the top that's like mm. you've made it like yeah, just just do that for another yeah. 30 years and, and you'll get a nice pension and yeah. that's that so yeah. when i told people yeah i'm quitting for stand-up same thing but i imagine do you have like brothers uh sisters one brother one sister one brother one sister mm-hmm. and so how did the family react when you're like and, and what was the moment for you when you decided i'm gonna do this were you still in school were you working oh wow i'm <laughs> You're bringing a lot of stuff up here, Julie. Uh, <laughs> Get well, in touch with those emotions. <clears throat> I, uh, I've got a funny family, um, as I think most of us that are looking at our family would probably say about our own family. Mm-hmm. Um, really supportive my whole life. I mean, yeah, I was a big sports guy. I played, I, I played everything. Um, uh, big volleyball guy, actually, which uh, that volleyball was huge in Alberta at mm-hmm. the time. The big training facility for the national volleyball team was in Calgary. And, um, so there's many, many leagues. You kind of look at uh, uh, what the hockey leagues are out here in Ontario, and it starts from like you know small, small, and it goes all the way up to NHL. It's mm-hmm. kind of like what the volleyball scene was there, um, which is great to grow up. And so my parents, I mean, they were you know front row at every game, every match, every every everything. Played basketball too, and baseball, and uh, actually not too much hockey. Um, but just coming from that environment, and uh, you know, I had a big brother and stuff that was right before me. Um, not too competitive because he was four years older than me, mm-hmm. so he could like beat the shit out of me whenever he wanted. Which, so that it kind of took out any sort of competition. It right, was just right. more like don't, don't, just don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I, I see that look in your eye 
I've yeah. got a beat down coming. I, I recognize that, but just don't kill me. Mm-hmm. Right. So there was really no, I mean, you fight back, but anyway, the four years I thought took away a, a lot of competition. And I think uh, the reason why I bring that up is that um, it, it, it caused, um, well, me and my brother were really close growing up mm-hmm. and, and my sister was my sister. Mm-hmm. So she was right in the middle of two boys right? and didn't do anything that we did at all. She was an academic and she was a wicked smart um, and uh, played music, you know, she played uh, the saxophone. And uh, not just the saxophone, right? She, she, was the, she was like the lead saxophone who had like a second saxophone oh, yeah. on like a little stand <laughs> sitting next to her. <laughs> right, right. So then like halfway through the, the whatever, <laughs> not a music guy, halfway through the, uh, the, the orchestral piece of, uh, she would switch saxophones. Heavy right? duty. Yeah, so I'm in the back, a couple of jock brothers in the back of the house looking at this, like rolling our eyes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so it couldn't have been more different. And again, because of that, created closeness. Mm-hmm. So I have a really supportive uh, family, brother and sister, because um, we all do different things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, um, they, they were all for it for me you know the without even batting an eyelash it was cool i i because i did come home one day and i said hey so i'm moving to new york city and so did you have to so you were did you quit university uh that's what i like to say dad dad i'm quitting university right and uh um, transcripts might say otherwise <laughs> <laughs> i got it but i yes i quit did you, and at that point you, so you had an agent in Calgary and everything and, and you had your like mm-hmm. one foot in the door, doing some plays <clears throat> here and there. And what, what uh, triggers the decision to study at the Playhouse? Well, a couple of things. That's Can a I, big step. I mean, that's huge. Oh, it's you a massive get, step. You have to go through, not, I mean, it's a big life step just mm-hmm. to make the decision, but even logistically speaking, it's a big deal. You yeah. have to get uh, student visas and all this involved. And, and yep. so how... How do you make that decision, and why the Playhouse in New York? Well, uh, I think a couple couple factors uh, come into play here. One is, and I'll make I'll try to make this short. It is my favorite story, so we'll take one quick little step back. Please take your time. Um, uh, it was um, well, I got hurt when I was in uh, my final year of high school. I busted up my ankle, and um, but it, I didn't really realize at the time that that psychologically really messed me up. Mm-hmm. So then I graduate and um, pretty much sports stopped uh, at that time. I go, I go to UC. Um, I was supposed to be, I was being looked at by a couple of different, you know, the, the volleyball team and the basketball team in my final year. And they just closed the book and walked away and it crushed me. Um, so I, I end up, I'm at university, yet I'm not playing anything. And that was my whole life up to that point. It was weird that... I was just, you know, I just felt like a nobody. I'm mm-hmm. walking around and and um, winters are horrible there and UC has got to be the ugliest campus, I think, <laughs> in North America, if not the world. Um, they have all these underground tunnels <laughs> to get to all the buildings because <laughs> there's so much snow and it's minus 30. No one wants to walk across campus outside. Mm-hmm. So you're always in like a gray hallway. Right. Right. It's depressing. Mm-hmm. So I, I come home after school. I'm still, I'm still living with my folks, which also sucked because you go to, you go to university right in your city. Yeah. There's no reason to, to get a dorm room or whatever. Of course, yeah. Because you're like, well, I live in this, you know, this big, nice house with my room and all my stuff. Like, mm-hmm. Why do I want to go and you know sleep in a shitty like dorm room totally. with some like probably weirdo roommate that I end up getting? So anyway, you suck it up, you live at home, and uh, so I come home after after classes one day, and um, uh, the routine is set. You know the bag goes down, you roll a joint, you sit in the couch, and and you flip on the whatever, you flip on the TV, and I, for whatever reason I'm flipping around channels, and and uh, this news show comes on. And um, it's doing this uh, this little segment on this acting studio in Calgary. Whatever catches my eye for no real reason. Um, so I, I mean, it's like a three minute thing. So I watch this thing, and at the end of it, um, they have like the the address and the phone number of the of the place on the on the bottom of the screen. Great, go about my day. Whatever. Very next day, very same situation. You know life shitty 
throw my bag down, roll joint, hop on the couch, <laughs> watch the TV. And it was the exact same time because you're in like routine, mm-hmm. whatever. And that same news show was on when I'm flipping channels. And it made me think about the day before. And, uh, and it made me think about that segment of that acting studio. And then it kind of made me think about that English class that I'm in, right, that I'm actually enjoying. And it was this really weird moment. Um, and it only, it only seems like it has meaning now because it's led to everything mm-hmm. else in my life, right? That was, that was like, you know, well, 17 years ago, mm-hmm. basically. Um, so I've led my, you know, second half of my life since then. So obviously it was, it was a big moment. I said to myself, I went, I remember going to um, like the desk by the phone and I wrote down this phone number that I thought was the number from the TV the day before. Just going on memory. It's going on memory, right? And there's nothing about it that day before that I said, remember this number, remember this number. Mm. Nothing, right? <clears throat> so I write it down, and I remember looking at it, and I, I made a little deal with myself. I said, self, <laughs> if, this is, if I call this number and this is that acting studio, I'm signing up for a class. If it's not, whatever. I don't know what a lot. I don't know what the other side of that is, but and like you said, it's 17 years ago, so you can't just Google it or whatever. And it, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, <laughs> yeah. So the information would have been gone. <laughs> There's right. no, no way of finding it. No, but it was it was a funny little moment. So I, uh, I I call up the the number, of course, and we'll do. I guess we'll do a little plug here. It's all right. It's all right, it's all right to name drop. Absolutely. Um, so I I dial this number, and and uh, lo and behold, Company Rogues Acting Studio. How can I help you? And uh, I said, one class, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I signed up for a class. And um, there was this married couple that, w- that, w- that were running that studio. They were from out east. Um, Joe Norman Shaw and his wife, Christiane Hurt. And they were doing groundbreaking stuff in Calgary. I and mean, there was no acting studios in Calgary, mm-hmm. right? Like these guys were putting on small productions. They had a student base. They were teaching, you know, uh, scene study classes as well as technique classes, as well as, uh, you know, voice, body, breath kind of classes, whatever, movement. And, um, I mean, everyone was going for, for that small scene in Calgary. Everyone was going berserker, right? Because they'd never seen this before. Mm-hmm. This was like full... Um, uh, professional, uh, you know, uh, actor training stuff. And anyway, the, the, the woman at that school, um, our studio, Christiane, had uh, studied previously in New York City. She studied at the HB studio, the Herbert Berghoff studio, which is a sort of a very cool studio. Um, you kind of piecemeal together what you want. And it's sort of what they base their studio out of as well. There's a bunch of different courses with different teachers. So you don't just, it, it is a big school, but you can basically set up your own programming. Right. Which is very cool. It's like I want to take one of this, one of this, one of this, one of this. And she was, she was, she was great. Great actor. She was on the, you know, the Calgary scene or even like the regional theater scene. And uh, she actually had like a film and television career, which blew everyone's mind. Um, really great lady. And you know, of the lot of new students in there, I took, I don't know, three or four classes with them, some scene study, did a couple performance intensives or whatever through them. Then I get an agent and I'm going on commercial auditions and I'm going out for like, uh, you know, small TV roles and stuff like that. And I'm like, I don't know how to act at all. So I had this one conversation with her one day and she said, um, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to, um, it's all the kind, you know, I was a funny kid and I was like, I was a ham and, and uh, self-conscious and, and all that other crap. And I just thought that if you, if you Chandler Bing most moments in, in the world, you can get away with, with a lot. You can get pretty far in life. So uh, I said, well, I think I want to learn how to do this properly. And she said, uh, well, we have two paths in front of you from what she could see. Uh, there's a pretty big uh, improv circuit going on in Calgary at the time. Um, I don't know if you know the, the movie Fubar, of course, at all, right? Those mm-hmm. guys were those guys were coming up mm-hmm. then, right? And and uh, Loose Moose Theater and 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 those guys were, were were doing it, but there was like this kind of this jump from this, little, this little, kind of this indie um, uh, comedy scene in in Calgary straight over to Van, go to Vancouver, and from Vancouver the path was always L.A. Mm-hmm. so she's like you can do that you know you got some opportunity here she's pretty realistic as well she's like well what's your best shot 
She said, we got that path laid out for you. She said, uh, or you can do like you say you want to do and you can go learn how to do this properly. Don't take any shortcuts. And you can go to New York City. And uh, she said, told me all about the school that she went to. She said, but you know where I always wanted to go but didn't was the neighborhood playhouse. I had no idea what that was. And uh, I started looking into it. And bing, bang, boom. That's where I ended up. Yeah. I mean, her, her word was a lot, I think, for me. Right. And I trusted her. And, and uh, I, I'm glad that I'm glad she wasn't fucking with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm just punking you. I'm glad she meant it, right? Uh, and and yeah. how do you, but how do you make the leap? Do you just do the same thing, call Neighborhood Playhouse and go all take one class? Like, how do you find out about the curriculum? How do you know what to get into? Did you know anything about the Meisner technique I at that didn't. point? Isn't that odd? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I mean, uh, um, sh- uh, other than, <clears throat> excuse me, because Christian was, was teaching a little bit of the Meisner technique at the time. So I'd heard of it. I've heard the name. Mm-hmm. But no, I didn't know anything about it at all. So I actually, I started, um, started researching the school and, um, it's so funny. Like this, this is stuff that I, I, I think about now on the business side of things. Uh, there's always that carrot, right? it's like, how do you entice people? Like, what is this, what is this program known for? What can mm-hmm. it do for people? Mm-hmm. Cause everyone, everyone wants that in some capacity and you always want to be able to offer that. Right. Other than just, it makes you feel good. Yeah. I don't know. And right? now it's gotta be yeah, more of a purpose to it. Um, but the playhouse, the big thing was, uh, all, you know, this huge industry showcase that they have and they invite all the Eastern, you know, East side directors and producers. And it like, sounds like a really big deal. They do. They, they fill their, you know, their 250 seat theater at the end of the year with a whole bunch of big wigs who make their rounds and they go to every school, but you work up to that, you know, two years of uh, really intense training for pretty much that moment. Mm-hmm. And we all knew that at the beginning. And the teachers knew that as well and treated us as such. You know, what kind of product are we putting out mm-hmm. come, come showtime at the end of the year? Um, so that was a big deal as well. And from that, you know, then it's like, <laughs> like okay, well, I don't care what they teach. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Right, right. right? So um, uh, I honestly totally fell into it like it was very fortunate but mm-hmm. i had you know i trusted the opinion of, of someone but but when you look at kind of those two stories put together it's it's um i don't know it's pretty serendipitous i guess yeah. or it's like sure. I just, i'm going on gut you mm-hmm. know what i mean and, and i i think i got really lucky mm-hmm. really at the end of the day and and I, I mean i'm i'm sitting there at 19 years old and i'm reading the <laughs> i'm reading the miser book on the plane it's in, it's in New, to York. New York. I'd already been accepted to school. You know, it's Friday. I, I show up Monday, you know, and I'm like flipping through. And this is what, like 98? Uh, nine, it would have been 99. 99. Yeah. And uh, do you have to audition to get in there? Because they t- <laughs> what do they take, 200 people? So, so many stories. Get uh, into it. This is, what, this is what it's all about. Uh, um, oh, man. Looking back, yeah, the life. Um, okay. Too much so, life. <laughs> way too much life. So there was, well, I mean, I'm conversing with this uh, awesome lady named Beverly Sugarman. She's in New York? She's in New York. Okay. She's at the Playhouse. She's, mm-hmm. she got, she's got it. She's 97 if she's a day, mm-hmm. right? Like she's just this old school bird who is uh, like so inappropriate and just loves young men. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just this old lady. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like she's flirting with you on the phone, like already, right? Mm-hmm. And and she's batty as hell. Like she's mm-hmm. losing her mind. And uh, and she was an absolute gem. Like anyone who came across her path in life was fortunate. And um, every time I called in, she because my dad was calling in as well, and and uh, well, he's the money, right? So she mm-hmm. he needed to be in on this, right? And every time I called in to get more information or something else that I had to fill out or get to them, who, who is is this? Is this the father? Or is this the son? <laughs> and, uh, um, she's like, because I want to talk to the young one. <laughs> Like okay, okay, it's great. Yeah, it's me. Um, but she's like, you gotta, you you gotta get here. Like she was, she was so fun, so New York, and always seemed mad at me. Mm, right, <laughs> you gotta get to New York. You gotta, you gotta interview with the director, Jason. Is this the father? Is this the son? You gotta get to New York. 
And I'm like, I can't, I can't just like, I can't, I'm in Calgary. I, 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 I can't just, I'm like, can you, can you, like, is it, you know, um, is there a good shot of me getting in? Like, what is this interview? She's like, no, I don't know. Probably not. We have thousands of applicants every year. You got to get here and interview. I'm like, no, I, even at my 19 year old self, like I right. was like, no, I'm, I think I'm too practical for that. I can't, mm-hmm. I can't just like on a whim fly to New York for an interview with like, and you know, I can't drop all that money. I don't have mm-hmm. all that stuff. And I've never been to New York and, and, I, and I'm like, no, that's ridiculous. And then, so after all this back and forth, she's like, well, you know what? I think you need Peacock. <laughs> I think you need Peacock. I'm like, what? What is Peacock? She's like, this is re- the regional rep. The regional rep. So she puts the uh, the um, the the director of the school, Harold Baldridge, at the time, and he was he was a character as well. But he was he's a Canadian boy, and he'd been at the helm of the neighbor playoffs for some weird reason um, uh, for decades. He used to be uh, a big wig at Theater Calgary, mm-hmm. and my dad ended up knowing him because my dad was like crazy. Uh, like a board, I don't know. Everything's lining up. Stars are aligning. So anyway, he gets on the phone. And he's like, "Listen, there's a, a regional a, an old friend of mine uh, heads up the acting program at U of A named Thomas Peacock. He is acting as one of my you know Western Canadian regional reps. He can see you if you can't get here." I'm like, great, let's do it. So I'll contact him. <laughs> That's amazing. It is amazing. And this guy's like, okay, well, this is what I need. He takes it like uber seriously. Mm-hmm. He's like, I need, uh, I need four monologues. I need two comedic, two dramatic. I need two songs, and I need a dance piece. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> That's a heavy load. <laughs> yeah, I need a dance piece. So I'm like, okay. So I, I, I'm like, you are aware that I've never studied acting. I'm trying to get into an acting school. Like, right. I don't know what I'm doing. So I hire coaches and I go through all this material and I get all this stuff ready. I've got like Shakespeare. I've got, I've got this, um, you know, I've got this Iago monologue from Othello. And uh, I think I did something from MacIver as well. And uh, I do remember I sang uh, Giants in the Sky from Into the Woods. <laughs> I would kill to get a hold of a tape. Of Mo- most people would, I think. Most people would. <laughs> What'd you do for the dance piece? It was completely like ad libbed. Like <laughs> I made it up on the spot. I was like, oh, you know what? I'm feeling okay. I, you know, I've been going to the clubs lately. I've been, going, I've been going to the bars, and I think that I, I just think that I can jam. I think I'll be okay. So anyway, three hours up to Edmonton. I was locked in a in, in like a rehearsal hall with this uh, I don't know eighty five year old batty uh, the head of the U of A acting department who was just looking down his glasses at me for another three hours and then three hours home and I'm like oh man that was that was an experience for Holy sure Holy shit talk about that uh, <clears throat> the that process so how did the monologues go how did you feel were you scared shitless at this point because really your only experience is just basically nothing right I'd go, I'd go with nothing yeah. I, I played Romeo once in, mm-hmm. a, in one of the uh, acting classes um, and I tried to change it all um, I, yeah I did the balcony scene and I was like you know what I don't think this should be played on like a, on a balcony I think I'm just gonna I think I'm gonna be in the room mm-hmm. I, I remember doing that yeah so no I didn't know how to act I was screwing everything up it went horribly I mm-hmm. think in my opinion I, I was scared shitless um, is it but, one of those moments now that you look back and you're like ugh what the fuck? Like, it's not actually like. Yeah, I say that. Of course, of course, I was nervous. Of course, I was scared. But I mean, uh, youth does so much mm-hmm. for us, right? Like, as we get older, like the the tiny like I'm like I'm terrified right now. Like the tiniest things scare the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. But back then, I'm just like, no, I got this. What? Right. Like, yes, I was like, blind confidence. I'm, I'm Napoleon Dynamite up there, yeah, yeah. like dancing my ass off. <laughs> and it's like, you know, uh, it's horrible. <laughs> but like from my point of view, I'm like, cr- I'm crushing this. You have music playing? Of course like, yeah. I do. <laughs> of course. I've got like a, I brought a ghetto blaster and a, and a mixtape. <laughs> what were you dancing to? <laughs> I don't know. That I don't remember. That part I don't remember. Nine, the 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 spring of ninety nine. That's amazing. Right. And were you just was there just one guy watching yeah. you? Oh. Yeah, it was just him. It was just him. And I, I still remember after three hours, it was this long. It was one of the dance uh, studios. Must have been mirrored walls and long hardwood hardwood floors. Two two doors, and I'm 
I went to, to leave at the end uh, at one door, and he was going back out the one at the far end. And he stopped and, and uh, looked down this long uh, dance hall to me. He looks up and kind of clears his throat, and he says, uh, you certainly are a spirited young fellow. <laughs> and he walked out. <laughs> and I sat there, and I go, I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> that was the three hours of my life that I'll never get back. Oh, that's right? amazing. So when and then when <clears throat> at what point do you hear back? Well, Any feedback? Mm. I um I because I lined up a few things, right? What, well I was ironically trying to get into U of A mm-hmm. as well at the time. University of University of Alberta. Alberta the yeah. Because they um they have uh, they did back then. I'm not sure the state of it now. I'm, I'm sure it's it's pretty similar. But one of the premier, um, you know, BFA acting programs in Canada. The only uh, it may have changed now because the the state of business and 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 what what have you. But back then, 11 new students a year. That was it. Mm-hmm. That's all they took. And um, uh, I didn't meet one of the requ- well. Because I, because my transcript said otherwise, so I wasn't able to actually. I mean, you needed a year towards a, a degree in order right. to get into that program, which I didn't have. Um, but I always thought it was cool because I got to audition for the head of their acting department anyway, mm-hmm. um, and I ended up getting accepted to the program that I was going to. So I was like, "Ah, oh, screw you." Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I lined up a couple other things. I was trying to get into NTS, the uh, National Theater School in Montreal. Um, I had I came out east here. My brother was here at the time, and I came out east, uh, stayed with him, and I had an audition for Ryerson lined up. And it was during that stay that um, I got a call from my ma, my mother, who says, "Call Beverly Sugarman in New York City." <laughs> so I called Beverly Sugarman in, in, New York, in New York City. Go through the whole rigmarole of who I am and right, what right. I want. All this like, batshit crazy woman. And um, she just dives right into talking about New York. And for like five minutes on the phone, she's just like, listen, New York is really expensive. You have, you have this, you have this to pay for, you have this to pay for, you have this to pay for. Should you be accepted into the neighborhood playoffs? I just want you to know that if you get here, you have to pay for this, you have to pay for this. Going on and on and on and on. And I'm listening to this, this woman. I'm like, okay, uh, for a while, I'm like, okay, fuck, why are you, what? Why are you telling me? Like, again, I feel like she's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of all that, she goes, I just want you to know you've been accepted to the neighborhood playoffs in New York City. And I was just like, ah. That's amazing. Yeah, so I go ballistic. I'm was right. that your number one choice of all the oh, places? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All these other things. Everything just, I didn't even go to the Ryerson audition. Right. Like, it was like the next day or something like that. I blew that off. I'm like, screw you guys. I'm going to New York. Because how many and people did they accept there? 200 or something like that for the first year? 100. 100. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Shit, yeah. That's a big deal. So I, I get down there and uh, it wasn't, probably until halfway, maybe three quarters of the way through the first year, that uh, it comes out that never, like people start talking about their interview process and mm-hmm. stuff. <laughs> and it turns out of the whole first year that year, I'm the only one that auditioned. Really? How did All the others get in? The, a, a very breezy 10-minute interview <laughs> with the school's so director. So no song and dance. No song and dance. <laughs> and it, it's it's just so funny. It, it, it's like on one on one hand, it's absolutely maddening. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, you look at the director of the school and you're just like, you're so cool, man. <laughs> like you literally you make people come all the way. Like you're just like, you're so pimp. Right, right. right. Like everyone wants into your school and you're like, only if you can get over here and talk to me. Right. And even then, I might not choose you. Right, like I, I literally think his process was like, I'm going to talk to you for ten minutes, and if I get the slightest inkling that you're crazy, mm-hmm. that's the only thing that's going to prevent you from getting in here. Mm-hmm. But you got to be able to get over there. There's a lot, ton of Europeans and stuff. And right away, that filters out a lot of people. A lot of people, yeah. right? So it's just like self, you know, kick yourself out. It's, you know, kill your own chance. If you right. can't get there, then it's like, well, shit, you're lucky, man. That totally you were lucky. able to all line it's all, that up. It's all luck. If yeah. you look back at that whole like epic story that whole epic tale it's all luck it's mm-hmm. just it's it's the weirdest thing and so you get the tell what's what's the tuition like down there mm. not including living in new york well that's what kills you right, right. i mean it's actually uh comparatively to other programs down there it's re- it, i thought it was really good mm-hmm. like i mean at the time it was under 10 grand a year mm-hmm. which i don't know yeah that's that's not bad uh, yeah like of course at the time i'm like oh man that's so much money 
Um, but to do that program, you know, for the two years, for around twenty grand uh, in, in tuition, it's more than worth it. Like, mm-hmm. you, and then when you get in there and you see the inner workings of the actual actual business, you're just like, I don't know, like, how do they? Like, I don't know how they don't go out of business or don't go broke. They got tons of people on the payroll. They got a bunch of like high powered, uh, incredibly talented instructors. There's a whole team of them, you know, like that, that, that tuition money for only a hundred students. I mean, that gets eaten up like that. Right. right? And I think, I mean, it's gone up in the last several years now. It might be closer to 15,000 now. Mm -hmm. Um, but still, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's well worth the, uh, the cash. But then, yeah, what gets you is the, the lifestyle in New York, right? And how old are you at this point? 19, 20? Uh, I want to say I was, yeah, I was one of those. Maybe 20. I must have been 20 when I got there, yeah. So how is that? You, you, had you ever been to New York at this point? Again, youth. Youth, youth right? right? You're just like, you don't even realize how scared you should be. Right, right, right. You're right. just like, this, oh, this is awesome, man. And how do you find a place? How do you get into, you know, the whole thing? Like how do I, how do, how did I find it? Yeah, like you went down there. No, how did you find like a place to live and everything? Do you line all that up before going down? Well, let's, let's go back to my very supportive family for a moment. Right. So on that plane, uh, sitting next to me while I'm reading the Miser book, is mother and father. Mother and father. Fraser. They came down for oh, you. Oh yeah, that's amazing. Chaperone. Wow. Yeah, and uh, my dad was great. He uh, we we all stayed in a hotel and and um, uh, Pickwick Arms, I believe, on the uh, Upper East Side. Um, yeah, my dad was great. He, 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 um, my parents, they, they had season tickets to uh theater Calgary and like the uh, Calgary Philharmonic and mm-hmm. pr- pretty cultured and pretty, pretty cool folks. Um, so, you know, they're into it on, on that respect. They're like, wow, we're in New York city. Let's go, let's go see some stuff. I mean, you got us tickets to, uh, Miss Saigon, I believe a couple of big musical, Broadway musicals, something else. Can't remember. Um, but then like a bunch of like, off and off 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 broadway shows and stuff right the cheaper ones we he, we were at shows every night mm-hmm. and it was very cool he's like well this is what you're gonna this is what you're gonna do son you that's better, great you better go check out what you know what that's huge like. actually oh, it's absolutely huge and yeah. what did they do um like for a living yeah um uh, well, my dad has own, had his own business. I, I always like to say he was a, a professional businessman mm-hmm. uh he was a management consultant. And uh, my mom did like accounting and, and bookkeeping and stuff for him. For his oh for his company, yeah. And um, and then raised three kids full time. Um, so yeah, so he. And how long did they come down with you? That initial. Uh, well, they were good. I mean, they they were there. Better part of a week, mm-hmm. I guess, just to help me get settled. So yeah, so they we were we were shopping around for an apartment and stuff. We end up way out in the boondocks in uh, um, in Queens. Um, and then, you know, step in mom and, and take you to Sears and, and get you plates and, and, yeah, and yeah. all that stuff, which is hilarious and adorable. But, but looking back, but it's so great. Great. That's <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, yeah, they stuck around, they got me all settled in. And when, when they took off there, there was that, uh, you know, that Monday morning when I woke up in my apartment in Queens you know, by myself, and you know, I got to get my ass to school and and start figuring this out. So, no no roommates or anything like that. Just <laughs> no. that's fucking awesome. I, didn't know I think that's was. that's better. It it was. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, uh, it's great now, but at right, the time, right. like, you really you just want to be involved. In it. I mean, so that's true. When I went back for my second year, I, I lived with a couple of Canuck boys that I went to school with and and uh what I didn't know what I didn't realize is I was starting like this lineage from the company rogues in in Calgary to the playhouse so uh there was a guy, I I lived with um uh, a friend of mine James Murray who um Jimmy I'm going to drop your name buddy who um uh was a really good friend of mine down there and he w- he graduated with me so we were in the second year and this other guy uh John Wildey who was coming from Calgary, he moved in with us, so we took him under our wings. And he, he was, was first year when you guys were second year. He was in the first year. And then after him, there was uh, uh, Stuart Cummings, and there was uh, Dustin Olson, and there was Ryan Cowie. Yeah, all these uh, all these boys just started filing, filing through from the That's company great. of rugs. Yeah, it was great for them, too, because they almost started looking like this feeder program mm-hmm. to, the, to get people into the, the mm-hmm. neighborhood playoffs. And... Uh, Talk about the second year because they they cut it down quite a bit. They do. It um, 
it's quite an amazing thing actually they they end up creating this uh this whole other aspect of the program is just like basic straight competition Mm -hmm. and uh they literally do the whole you know look to your left look to your right on day one and only one of you is going to be back and it's true they cut it down by a third so 30 people make it year two. yeah yeah so there's your class was even a little lighter than that right like a little bit, yeah. So that we had, um, there were three uh, first year classes of around th- 35, mm-hmm. let's say, 33, whatever. Um, and and uh, they, then it goes down to one for the second year. They choose one group. How? How so, do they choose one group? Oh, you'd have to ask them that, man. Right. The methods of their madness, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of that stuff in there. It's a, what's going to be the best product at the end of the, you know, the second year and and who who uh, you need, kind of need different types to be able to cast off of and And I'm sure even pe- a lot of people just quit on their own. A lot of people quit on their own. Yeah, Christmas was huge. First year, you come back in January and you're like, okay, there's like five, six, seven people that aren't here anymore. And at which point do you find out you made it to year two? Um, the second year it's uh well they they send you a letter Mm -hmm. and it's so like non-personal it's Mm -hmm. hilarious it's just like and i remember like my first year acting teacher at the end of uh end of the first year he was like listen you guys are because everyone's freaking out about it and stuff like what are we gonna know and who's gonna tell us how do we find out and stuff he's like listen you're gonna get a letter in the mail it's either gonna be a, a, a thick letter or a very thin one you want the thick one because right. that's like thin, more, right. that's more applic- or information or whatever mm-hmm. that they need, and and the thin one is basically like thanks for coming out. <laughs> oh, that must be soul crushing <laughs> to get the thin it's one. Absolutely soul crushing, and a lo- and people like I've heard some stories. Some people d- like did not take it well at all. Like went I can't imagine ballistic because at that point, if you're going to the neighborhood playhouse, you mm-hmm. take this shit seriously. It's a passion. You're you're yeah. all in at that yeah. point, and to get yeah. that thin letter must just be fucking devastating. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, it's like well, it's like getting cut off a off a you know a team that you mm-hmm. really want to be on. You train and you you're, you're you're committed and you work your ass off. You work your guts out. You do everything that they say you know that you should be doing, and then they don't pick you. And that's mm-hmm. all. That's never a good feeling. That's never a feeling that I had very often because I always got picked right. for, for teams or whatever um so i don't know what i would have done mm. really if if i wasn't chosen because after a, what it didn't really take long before i realized okay a i'm out of my element mm-hmm. i gotta i gotta bust my ass here to to figure this this shit out as well as uh i mean there's just there's a few things that that went into play like just don't miss a class mm-hmm. don't ever be late don't ever don't fuck around don't not do the work like and it was a pretty heavy load. Like there were some days where you're like, "Oh man, I don't know if I can even get this done." There's so much to do, mm-hmm. um, but you just like, you know, put that beside and, and and you just keep going for it, right? And I, so, at what point did you get the thick letter? Um, I was one of the later ones too, because we were all in contact with each other, and there were there, letters were in Europe before they were in Western Canada. Right. I was like, oh, so you went home on. after you didn't spend the summer in New York. You went home, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you, so yeah, I guess I would guess you give up your apartment because you don't know, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, I had a one year lease, right. and um, they were assholes. They were like, okay, you have to pay for the entire year up front because you're a foreign student, and we don't mm. trust you or what. Or whatever. So I, I'm just like, hey, father, <laughs> hey, Faja, can you write a check? Um, but yeah, it was just a one year lease. And then, yeah, then you, you, you know, uh, I, I think I even rented furniture. Mm-hmm. I remember. So all that went back. My life just like closed on like May 30th. And then I, and then I got on a plane and I, and I, and I went back, you know, through Indianapolis, St. Paul, gateway to the West. And uh, I was back in Calgary. And I was there for a week, and I woke up one day, and I went postal, and uh, killed everyone in my family. No, <laughs> I, uh, I I shot up out of bed, and I just like put on my my my, my clothes and my jacket, and went downstairs and hopped in my stupid car and and, and drove down to the the uh, the flight center, <laughs> and just walked in. I didn't I didn't even know. I'm just like I got I have to get out of Calgary. Mm-hmm. I got to get out of here. Like it was it was like culture sh- reverse culture shock. I'm like, okay, after that experience for a whole year, and now I'm sitting here, you know, eating shreddies at the breakfast table with my mom. In uh, conservative <laughs> Calgary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. in Stephen Harper's writing. Right, right. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah, what is now, yeah, mm-hmm. and from his writing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
yeah, the the hotbed of conservative. When you power. say you went down to the flight center, do you mean airport? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> I was like, what's the flight center? Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, no, like a travel agent. Like oh, a travel oh, got agent. it. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to get out, just to yeah. go on a trip. So okay. I walked in. I walked in, and I, and I knew. And again, my brother was still out east here, so I just I just got on. Uh, I got a ticket to Toronto. I mm-hmm. just came here, and I left the next day. So. Uh, uh, and I spent the I spent the whole summer in in Toronto, and uh, just to get my mind off it, and to just I don't know, just keep uh, doing doing what I was doing. I got a got I got a, a I guess I got a, yeah I got a job here. I was working with a catering company, and I was I was just kind of couch surfing and mm-hmm. a little bit with my my brother actually ended up in Kitchener, so that wasn't that ideal. Um, I was mostly like sleeping on the couch of a, a buddy of his that he went to high school with and stuff, and and uh, I don't know. That's one. That was kind of my first taste of Toronto, and I liked it. I was like, hey, "There's a big city. There's a lot going on here. It's close to NY. I yeah. like it. Yeah, it's like yeah. a smaller, cleaner version of New York, basically. Basically, yeah, yeah for sure. And so, um, when did you find out you were going for a year two? It was it was uh, pretty late. It was towards the end of the summer. It was like mid August, maybe. Fuck, that must have been just. Like, it was, and I was waiting every day. I started going a little bit crazy because mm-hmm. I, I I literally was like the second last guy to uh, to get their letter, and I think it was just I don't know. Um, it it was just the way they mailed things off. I think mm-hmm. really because the Europeans, it's like they went east to west or something. And I might have been like the furthest west. And how short notice before uh, the second year started did you get the letter? Well, they I guess they they start, who knows, uh, just second week in September, maybe 10th, 11th, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is mid-August, so it was probably three weeks, a little, little under a month away. So I, but I mean, like I was all ready to go. Like I'm just right. waiting for the, you know, there wasn't anything that was going to keep me back at that right. point. Right. And what was your reaction when you got the letter? Did you did so relief? Did, did your parents <laughs> have to call you and be like, "Oh, you got the"? Yeah. The, and, and I asked them. I said, "Mom, is it is it thick or thin?" <laughs> <laughs> Fucker. She's like, I can, "Well, it's pre- it's pretty thick, but I mean, it's not all that thick." It's, uh, <laughs> I'm just like, "All right, forget it. You're no, just open it." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, forget this. Just open the letter, Bob. And is there yeah. any aspect when you get it, you're excited, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you're ready for it. But is there any aspect of dread where, like, shit, now I have to get down there again, find a place again, go to Sears again, go all, all right. these things? Yeah, but I was, uh, by that point, I was um, way cooler. Right. And you knew people so, by then. And, yeah, exactly. Right. And, and I mean, if I could go back, the one thing that I, that I would have changed in the first year is it would have gone straight to the school. Right. Because, I mean, they have such a community there, big bulletin board with, right. you know, returning students that are looking for roommates. And it's a big shout out to all new people coming mm-hmm. in saying, like, listen, there's two of us in this one apartment. We need one more. Call this number. And, yeah. Um, so I... I definitely would have gone gone that way. Everyone's everyone's living together. That's yeah. just the way it goes, right? Yeah. And there were even like some pretty cool uh, like Manhattan apartments that people were all divvying up and mm-hmm. and uh, almost dorm room style. But you have like five or six or eight of you all living there, and mm-hmm. it makes it more affordable. And it's fine because I mean you're you just sleep there, right? And right. You're, and and your so dorm room style is actually it's almost better really because mm-hmm. you're at school. I mean, we like our classes start at nine a.m. Mm-hmm. but like, like this is really intense, you know, training for the actor, and you, you cannot, you can't drop the ball. You have to be at like eight p.m. energy of mm-hmm. like a Saturday night show right. at nine a.m. on a Monday. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, we're up early, and we're. I mean, there was this, there was kind of this YMCA type thing right next door to the school. So we're all like working out or mm-hmm. on the treadmill or doing yoga or whatever people are doing at like 8 a.m. So when you walk in at nine, you're like alert and alive and, and, and ready to go. Um, but then even still, like there were classes right through to 5, 30, 6 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And then you stay after and you do some work for maybe an hour, a couple hours, whatever you can do. So then, yeah, then you go home and you, you know, you, no one has TVs, you can't afford them. Right. Can't afford, you know, can't afford cable. You can't afford a television set. Plus mm-hmm. everyone's coming from all over the world. So no one's going to bring you know, other than like a couple suitcases of clothes to New York City, right? No one's that really outfitted with much stuff. So, I mean, right. it, was, it was way, it was, looking back, it was so much more culturally rich and mm-hmm. so much just cooler in terms of um, 
uh, you know, getting conversation, like talking to people. Who does that? Right, right. This is, listen to me. I won't shut up. This is so great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We would just sit on rooftops and smoke cigarettes and fucking talk. Magical. That's, <laughs> Isn't that wild? That's the, that to me is like the ideal, like that's when I think of a romantic, you know, New York, that's mm-hmm. just what it is. Just yeah. you're, you're going for it with people and you're just all striving for yeah. this, this dream, this yeah. passion you're following. Yeah. Uh, late nights on a roof, yeah. smoking cigarettes. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than it that. It really I mean, doesn't. That's the ultimate experience. Uh, Absolutely. Life experience. Yeah. So you're, you're living in Manhattan? Uh, I, w- I wasn't. Uh, I was always a, I was always Queens bound. Um, mm-hmm. But I had, like I said, my, my friend Jimmy, who was in my first year class with me, he was all, he was ready to go. He had his letter. Mm-hmm. He got his for he's from Eastern Canada and he got his first. And he's like, listen, uh, don't worry about it. I mean, we, I, I'm getting a place. Where I'm gonna f- like I'll be there. It's, I'm gonna get a three bedroom because that we all, I don't know we just worked out. It's around five fifty six hundred each or whatever with the majority of the the queen style of three bedrooms. A bit more space than Manhattan yeah. would give you. He's like, I'm getting it anyway, and I'll find roommates, but I'm, I'll save you a bedroom, whatever. And so and it worked out fine. I called him mid August. I'm like, finally, I'm in. I'm in. He's like, oh, good, great. good. You got the you got the room at the end of the hall off the kitchen. I'm like, thanks, man. Oh, that's great. I lived in a three bedroom in Queens too. <laughs> yeah, there in you Astoria. go. Astoria, train yep. baby. Thirty first in Ditmars. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. You're yeah. a bit further out. I was. Uh, oh, I won't even remember the cross street now. But it was uh, maybe maybe four stops up. Mm-hmm. You're you're more at the end of the end of the road there, aren't you, Ditmars? Yeah, it's yeah. I've actually the last tr- the last it's stop on last the train. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever get over the fact that you were in New York? Because I didn't. For I was there two and a half years, and I just right up until i left i just walked around going holy fuck i live here like it felt like i was in a movie the entire time i never got over that most 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 of the time yeah i think that um just the nature of what we're doing it it really pulls you in to it and and um uh, the fact that you're in new york i mean with the exception of maybe saturday night Mm -hmm. um then it dawns on you again when you actually when you use New York, <laughs> when mm-hmm. you actually go out in it, uh, but for the most part, I'm going from A to B, A to B, home home to school, home to school, home to school, because that's all that's all you could really do, right? Yeah. Um, hit the grocery store and that's it. And it was it was wild. I mean, and I mean, a lot of people, uh, and I I realize that 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 may sound incredibly boring, but it was it was we were there for a purpose, and it was it was pretty intense, mm-hmm. and there were people that definitely went off the rails like new york got them yeah it does it, it i mean totally it's got there's them. two people uh, there because uh, the energy of it all i mean yeah. there's so much so much stimuli it's either you love it or you absolutely fucking hate it there's mm-hmm. like no in between yeah and it's a personality thing it is and if you're there on something that's so um mm-hmm. such a privilege to be a part of as the neighborhood playhouse yeah. if you're one of these people that hate it yeah that will drive you crazy yeah because uh, you just have to you're like torn you're like i'm doing this thing it's huge I got into year two, let's say, but mm-hmm. I fucking hate this place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would that would be enough to mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. send you right off the deep end. Yeah, and 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 the opposite of that too is some people were just partying like crazy. Like yeah, I was going to ask totally, about that. Yeah, uh, a lot of partying. Did you did you or were you so focused <laughs> that just once in a while sort of thing? No, I I partied like fucking crazy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. But it, what what I I think that's what I miss. <laughs> that's what I miss most. Mm-hmm. No, but I mean in the way that. It was all house parties, right? Like, yeah. like, uh, that school was just—it was so cool, man. Like, they're—they're really—it's like this hundred-person family, right? Which that's a like it's not that many people, but that's that's a good party, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. and then someone had a party every Saturday night, right? Right, that a hundred people would come to, mm-hmm. and we're all for the most part doing our work Monday to Friday, right? And it's pretty intense, and you really are just with your. And, and even each class is broken up into, you know, two groups. So you're with like a smaller section. 15 so, people or something. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you don't even see the other 15 people in your own class right. very often. Because they might be, you know, at speech while you're at voice. Or they might be doing jazz dance while you're at music. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you meet, you know, for, for the acting class part twice a day. Um, but you might not necessarily work with each other. And it's not social time anyway. They might be sitting, you know, it's 30 people in there. And they're sitting way over, you know, he's not chatting. Yeah. Anyway, so Saturday night comes and it's just like, 
you know, let's let's, let's go crazy. Yeah, let's go crazy. Let's, it's so good to see you. Yeah, I yeah. love you guys, mm-hmm. right? And you get to hang out until the sun comes up, which we did like every every mm-hmm. Sunday morning. Right. right, we're going for breakfast somewhere. And because it's an experience, like you said, that draws you in. You're so focused on that that mm-hmm. you can you barely see anything outside of that. Yeah. Is there a lot of like okay, so partying or a lot of hooking up, people sleeping with each other? <laughs> is that happening a lot? Because theater, I mean, that's sort of fuck. Why not? Hey, man. Yeah. I, I I know how many is it now? Six marriages from that year from that school from that school? not necessarily from that year. No, um, uh, yeah, uh, definitely. I know I know a bunch of marriages, like marriages from this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, it's your whole world, your whole life. Yeah. Plus, it's such a it's such a hyper uh, intense time mm-hmm. as well, where this work d- directly uh, you know transforms you into. Um, like kind of the best version of yourself, right? In a way, right? So, uh, you know, boom when you get when you get that going on. Plus, everyone removes politeness and that's so, right. You know, so I mean, I don't know if you know, and for those of you who are listening, uh, this technique, uh, if you get a good handle on it, is wicked in a bar. Mm-hmm. Right, right. <laughs> let's talk about the technique a little bit, sure. Because uh, yeah. we kind of did touch on it off the top, but let's really uh, go yeah. back. So the 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 Meisner technique. First of all, at which point did you realize it was for you? Because um, it it isn't for everyone. It's intense. It's it's. Uh, it's I, I guess that's a good question. I think I almost said right away, mm-hmm. but uh, I guess that's not necessarily true. Looking back, um, uh, I think what kept me in it was my own. Uh, uh, will mm-hmm. um, I don't want to say stubbornness but um, uh, I once again I mean, we, we can go back to uh, I can relate everything back to sports always mm-hmm. so uh, immediately if someone in a position of power uh, or someone in the position of instruction um, I take uh, I, I always have a lot of respect for mm-hmm. until I don't but uh, I lead. I lead with with respect. So my first year instructor was was my coach, right? And just the way that I grew up in the Toronto volleyball or basketball scene, Toronto Calgary basketball or, or volleyball scene, um, uh, I was on some pretty in- intense and elite uh, teams and groups. And and if you didn't uh, have that respect for your coach, you're either you're either cut or or you just didn't go very far. Mm-hmm. So. I kind of grew up in, in, in sort of a uh, an environment of tyranny, right? <laughs> yeah, if you will. Enough. I mean, we're not ruling by democracy here, mm-hmm. right? And uh, any sports discussion that you'll you'll hear on on the fan five ninety, um, especially you know, last week when everyone was talking about the Leafs, um, it uh, it was all from the standpoint of like Randy Carlyle's out and their plans to get him fired and all that stuff. Like it's anarchy mm-hmm. if that respect or whatever isn't there. So anyway, that set you know that set me up for. Um, uh, I I feel a lot of success within this industry because you, you've always got you've always got a coach, whether that's a director or whether that's actually an acting instructor, or whether you're learning from someone. There's always someone in charge of mm-hmm. the creative process right and uh performers um they uh, a lot of problems can happen when when ego gets in the way obviously i think that's true of anything but um when actors can define and accept their role within the actual project right not just your character role but uh and then do that well and everybody works that way and then it really gives the person in control of that a, a lot more opportunity to do their job well, right? Because right? everyone's just doing their job, right? Um, but yeah, my friend, I forgot the question. <laughs> it was at what point you realized that the technique was for you. you, you right, were. right, right. So uh, <laughs> the tangents, I know. Sometimes you know, you know what I will say that I've completely forgotten that we're doing we're doing a podcast. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right. I'm just <laughs> I'm just I'm like in I'm in memory lane. I'm right. I'm right in there. This is fantastic. I forgot too, to be honest. Um, so. It, uh, Starting this work was insanely uh, insurmountable, almost. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, very, very quickly, you get... I got incredibly claustrophobic in that... Um, 
it's a very odd, I mean, it's almost hard to explain, but it, it's um, everything that you've known <laughs> all of a sudden is not useful mm-hmm. or even usable. It almost, it's almost like, and this is going to sound extreme, so I'll try to explain it, but it's almost like being in an insane asylum mm-hmm. when you're not insane. Right. Like it's that, it's that no matter what I do, it's, it's not helpful. <laughs> right. It's not assisting me. Right. And so. Yeah, you're telling people you're not insane. And they're like, obviously he is. That's why, like, it doesn't help. Exactly. You're like, no, please trust me. I'm not crazy. Exactly. So there are these people that are, that are saying, you know, respond impulsively. Mm-hmm. And you think that you are. And then they, they, they break that down and show you all these things that is actually occurring Whereas you think it's something else, mm-hmm. but the whole point is that you're thinking that right. it's something else, and the and they're trying to break through that to say, I want you to feel your way through it, not think your way through it. Mm-hmm. And right now, you're you're all thought, and and then it's that shift of focus that mm-hmm. is so. It is. It's like the Matrix. We we always we always make that comparison, right? And and, and it's it's um. It's a real mind fuck. Right. <laughs> you're fucking with your mind a little totally. bit. Totally. Right. So um once I, I, I got past wanting to uh just do what was asked of me mm-hmm. repeatedly, and I guess I guess do well, I'll say. I was I was a victim of that. I wanted to do well and and be and, and succeed and to be the good student and all that stuff. Um, once a few things started to dawn on me and once that shift really started to occur and all these feelings started, you know, coming out and, and, uh, a different side of me started to kind of rise up. Oh yeah. I was all in it's about halfway through mm-hmm. sometime. I think just, uh, just after Christmas, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was pretty quick, mm-hmm. I'd say. I'd say. So let's break down the technique. So Stanford sure. Meisner, his definition of uh, acting is living truthfully under given imaginary circumstances. And uh, to achieve that, you need to get off of yourself, ultimately. Put the focus outward, get affected by things, and express without thinking about it, removing your mind. I mean, I'm new at this, obviously. I'm like three months into... I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a lot of... I, I get in my own way. I'm th- I think a lot, and it's um, mm-hmm. hard for m- for me at times to to instead of trying to do it to just be and let things happen. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about uh, the philosophies behind it. Okay, um, give a, give us your perspective, or, or and by perspective I mean the, the cold hard facts. The cold hard facts. How how do you how do you strip down uh, and be present and remove ego and because uh, we do a lot of repetition but people mm-hmm. listening might not know what that is so explain a little bit about how how you get to that how do you get off of yourself because I think this is information that's valuable to uh, I mean because you even say with your class the whole thing uh, is about seven months. Mm-hmm. But you say that the first half would be good for anybody, not just anyone pursuing acting. Mm-hmm. So let's let's get into that part a little bit. Okay. Yeah, and I do believe that. I mean, there there are some people that come to us that um, uh, are are lucky enough to just take uh, a shot at this particular class, as opposed to a second city class or mm-hmm. a Sears and Switzer class or a scene study class, just because they want to try acting. Right, but they don't really realize that <laughs> we don't teach acting. Mm-hmm. You know, we it's a technique based on bringing out uh, truthful impulses and 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 the you know the path to true emotion and and how to come alive um, honestly, right? Without and lifting a, off that that social veil. Um, so they're they're very fortunate. So I, and I do think um, I mean the. That lot in particular, I'd say 80% of them, 90% of them will quit um, because they were in it in the first place to try something fun. Mm-hmm. And then they realized that, okay, well, this, 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 isn't, this whole process stuff isn't necessarily super fun. <laughs> no, it's not because you're ripping. Because you're, you're, we're so focused on other people's perception of ourselves yeah. every day. Yeah. 
and this teaches you to like fuck all of that you're <laughs> going to express and break down and feel yeah, yeah. shitty in front of other people yeah. so yeah no it's it's actually it's not it's rewarding it's but it's not incredibly rewarding but it's not fun the, right i right. gotta be honest with you when i go to class driving there i'm dreading i'm like oh i hope i don't go up first and now I'm telling you this i'll probably end up going first every time but because i think you know yeah. oh shit it, you just have to to uh, yeah. work through it because I know how rewarding it the other side of it um, yeah will be so that, 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 that's actually really interesting for me because uh, looking back yeah that that uh, like 40 minute uh, tr- uh, ride in the e-train mm-hmm. coming in from uh, Forest Hills Queens um, it, I was the same way just mm-hmm. dreading it right yeah you, you know I, you know and um, uh, especially once we got up to like uh, circumstance work and preparation, like I was going over my my circumstance in my mind, and I was preparing on the on a packed subway train, and and um, so that's interesting for me. The the thing that I I, I try to do just a, as a personal thing that's different from my instructors, because we're not I'm not trying to fool anybody. We're not in New York City, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this technique is it, it can live anywhere. I believe that, but. Um, they taught, like I said before, you know, pretty hardcore because mm-hmm. they, they had to put out a product at the end of the year for top industry people. And as soon as you slip a little bit, they stop coming. The, like the wheels fall off the wagon, yeah. right? So they were, they were slave drivers, right? And an old you know, kind of teaching partner of mine used to say, well, they, they taught with fear. Mm-hmm. And he believes that, uh, you know, we can... We can do the work and get all of these all, all the points across without having to do that you know you don't have to get out the switch and and uh, you know be whipping people uh you can teach a, a bit more lovingly i mm-hmm. guess or supportively because they, they weren't necessarily all that supportive it, it was their own kind of support i guess but it, it was all tough love right it was all tough love right so um yeah, I mean, but yeah, my dread, I guess, would come from a different place. It's not that it's not your your teaching style, or because I mean, you're great, you're passionate. It comes through in in the work. Yeah. Um, you're very effective as a as a coach and and teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that part. The other people in the class are great. It's just the the notion of getting up there and just removing that social veil, yeah. like you said, and not being in control of other people's perception of you and yeah. just letting all that go and and going through something going through something in front of other people like that whole thought yeah but then you get i mean it that dread sort of uh it all sheds when i once I, as soon as i get in the room mm-hmm. but just driving there i'm like here there's we go there's that anxiety there's yeah. that anxiety and it's not enough to make me to deter from it because i yeah. love it and again yeah. i know it's going to yeah. be it's rewarding and yeah. and i love it which is why i'm there every single time mm-hmm. Uh, so let's get back to the technique a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure, so, sure, sure. So well, I think that you. I'll just. I think you said it best just right there, and that's probably what I'm going to lead with is letting go. I mean, you mm-hmm. asked a few minutes ago how do you how do you get to that place where um, you know you can fall in contact with someone and get rid of some of that social stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's letting go mm-hmm. and uh, and figuring out how to do that. I guess is uh is something that we take a, a pretty hard look at right we have to establish what you're holding on to mm-hmm. right and then politeness gets in the way everyone's socially um and, and religiously and and um uh brought up lee uh, different mm-hmm. right and they they have their own you know their own systems and their own uh, you know uh, what's important and what are the beliefs and how are they taught and how are they raised and what are they taken into their adult life and, and, and how do they live their lives and, and what does that look like? Um, and it's this whole uh, golden rule kind of stuff that especially Canadians live by, right? Mm-hmm. You you don't want to be treated like shit, so you you know you make sure you go out there and, and, and treat people nicely. And, yeah. and that's, that's not what's in question. And I say that quite often. You know, there's no question that you're a nice person. Right. We all get that. You're loving. You're caring. Um, uh, you got, you have a big heart. We get that. Yeah. But there's something within that that uh, th- that gets in the way of just our truthful response to mm-hmm. stuff. And as actors, we need to be able to get get to what our impulsive self and what our impulsive uh response is 
because we're going to be asked, we have a very high demand and very little process time once it's game time. Mm -hmm. So you need to be working and training in a way that's all process that that uh, that feeds the game time result oriented industry that we live in mm -hmm. where people can look at you and go i need this and you you know very quickly run out the door interpret that and come in and produce it right, right. there's no time on the, in that moment once you have the job you have to do the work mm -hmm. you you can't be playing catch up so um it, it's pretty uh blatant that way when when we're trying to get rid of politeness and social kind of bullshit really, which is all idea-based mm -hmm. and has nothing to do with That's right. your heart, with your guts, with your loins, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything, you know, the neck and down mm -hmm. is what we try to try to work with. We try to, we try to cut you off at the head because that's what gets in our way. Yeah. And, and it's so true because like, it's like you said, you learn to um, trust your gut and act on impulse, whereas in real life, and this is where the, the Meisner technique, or at least the early stages of it can benefit anyone, is that it teaches you to, because in real life, you, you learn to uh, muffle your, your impulses mm -hmm. and sort of um, do the opposite of them sometimes because of politeness, because of social avails, because you're, yeah. uh, other people's perception of you, you want to come across a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it's great for that for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about how that translates to. So once you do get to that point, how do you how does that apply to acting? Once you get to which point? Like once you get to the point where you you can kind of you're off of yourself, mm -hmm. you've shifted focus outwardly, and you're learning to um, listen to your impulses mm -hmm. and sort of uh, act on that. How, how does that translate to acting? Well, there was this, uh, this instructor uh, of mine along the way that used to talk a lot about danger mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in, the, in, in the way that um, uh, he always used to use them. So I'll, I'll use them here as well. Marlon Brando mm -hmm. always had this element of danger about him in, in terms of unpredictability. Right. And you'd watch him, and he kind of made your, your heart start thumping a little bit because you didn't know what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. um, even though, even in, even in film, well, especially in, in, in those film roles, but um, he, he was, he was kind of like this caged animal in a way. And you didn't know if he was going, he didn't, you, didn't, you never knew if he was going to fight you or fuck you. Right. Right. And that was dangerous. That kept you on your toes. And the way that he was uh, uh, able to uh, be alive at that heightened level um, was, uh, I mean, his legacy, really, and mm -hmm. what was so astounding about him. And he trained in the same kind of style that we did. He was a Stella Adler grad, I believe. Um, and that, to be able to live, in, I mean, there's, there's a difference between what we're doing right now which mm -hmm. i i mean i'm which i find fascinating you mm -hmm. know it's 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 a really it's a good conversation mm -hmm. to have right would we film this and could we sell this as a film probably not right, right? um so uh what well, you hear me talk a lot about casualness right and like our instructors beat casualness right out of us right and the reason for that is Quite simply, all scripts are written at a heightened level because they're written about an event. Right. If, and if the script is not about an event, it's not going to get made or no one's going to watch it, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, uh, you know, it's reality TV. And even reality TV has found a way to be produced and scripted and, and uh, uh, dramatic and whatever. So there's the difference between regular life, civilian life, and then the heightened level of art performing arts right that's why we go to it because it's about something mm -hmm. so we want to live and work and train in a way that creates life that creates that heightened level of reality so we learn we train in a way that that um, uh, we work on coming coming alive off of another person as simple as that right um, and we we believe in the concept of there's no such thing as nothing Mm -hmm. There's always something there, right? And we work in a way with, with, with technique and with, um, I guess, um, what's the word? 
um, just fundamentals right. to uh, to uh, lay the groundwork to be able to get ourselves in a heightened state, in a, at a heightened level, right? And this repetition exercise is so so valuable because we're we're starting at zero, right? Mm-hmm. And we and you've seen it. You've seen people escalate very quickly with each other, right? And others, it takes longer, and everyone's different on different days. But it's working such a incredibly important performance muscle, mm-hmm. um, and it's really the art of taking in, the art of 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 uh, accepting, right? Pulling that in, pulling that in, pulling that in, getting out of your own way, recognizing what the other person is giving you and allowing that to affect you, right? Which is a lot easier said than done. Oh, man, you're telling me. A lot easier said than done. It takes time. Mm -hmm. But over time, you start getting more receptive and you start getting more um, responsive and then you start getting more spontaneous. And those things uh, combined, when you're walking around in that state, right, um, there, it starts to create that, that element of that kind of that X factor element, mm-hmm. that element of danger, mm-hmm. unpredictability, because we're, we're training uh, spontaneous responders. That's great. Which is pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. Get into it, people, the Meisner technique. Um, just quickly, we're going to go for the close here. Um, when did you decide you wanted to coach, train, teach? Well, um, somewhere along the way, because, uh, I, I, I mean, after, after New York, I, I, I shot out of there like a slingshot. Like and did you come camera. directly to Toronto after that? Um, well, I was there for, I did two years, and then I was there for another year working. Okay. And then I did, I did like a soft move up here while I was trying to figure out if it was possible to stay down. It was, a, hey, it was, it was 2001, man. Like, it was a tough time mm-hmm. for immigration down there. Um and so you know, in two thousand two, and then I hung out, and I was kind of splitting my time in '03 between here and, and and down there, and it was just getting harder and harder, and and uh, immigration really was kind of a kind of you know a big issue, and and uh, immigration lawyers were you know expensive at that time, and mm-hmm. and um, so it was a big crackdown and stuff, and I'm like, you know what, this these are, this is like my best time to be applying everything that I just learned. I don't want to. I don't want to be wasting it, you know, in law offices or working two jobs. Yeah. Just like, you know what I mean? Because the same can happen in comedy when you're in that position. You can kind of fall into limbo in between both countries where you're trying to get logistic. Yeah. Logist, you're going to get past logistics to work in the States and capitalize on opportunity down there. But until that all goes through, you can't. And then because you're spending a lot of energy there, you're missing perhaps opportunity up here in Canada. Mm-hmm. So you have to make a decision. I was in the same boat. Yeah. Um, and, and like you said, you're in your prime. You should. It's all fresh. Yeah. What you've learned. So you make yeah. the move to Toronto at that point. Yep. You start working right away. Right what? away. Right away. Right away. I mean, what brought me up here was uh, a buddy of mine who ended up. Uh, he was one of those the lineage of uh, Company Rogues guys. Mm-hmm. He came here, um, and he he called me. I was doing a, a, a job at a regional theater in, in New Jersey uh, at the time, and he said, uh, "Well, I've got this you know new theater company, and we're 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 putting on this production. Do we want you to come direct it?" Mm-hmm. So that's that's what brought me up here, and and I was like, yeah, I will I will direct it. And then a few months later, he moved down to New York and started going to the Playhouse. <laughs> and then after that, I mean, I he brought me back down there to direct a couple of different things for his company down there. Oh, cool. So yeah, it was it was very cool. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I was working like crazy, mm-hmm. working like crazy up here. Theater, the, theater, mean ton of theater. Yeah. yeah, I was working with various uh you know uh, independent theater companies i was doing a, did a couple tv things uh, uh a couple little small movie things you know doing it right mm-hmm. you're young and you're i was a jobbing actor right um and it was a ton of work and i was doing the acting work and i did that for like a long time it was like nine ten years doing that and somewhere in there um i i started looking at what it was for and it was all for other people Mm-hmm. You know, and I just felt like the type of work that I was doing, there there wasn't anyone else doing it. Mm-hmm. 
and it, it, it seemed kind of lost in the mix. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt that it was more important than that. Not that I was more important than that, but that the, the type of work and, and how it was, uh, it was helping uh, storytelling, basically, uh, was, was kind of getting lost in the shuffle. Um, and, uh, and I, I felt this real sort of need to start building something. And that's, that's what I did. I shut it all down and I opened up my acting studio. Um, so I get to do this work every day. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, it's a lot more fulfilling and, it, it, I feel like we're, we're beneath the, uh, the industry. Mm-hmm. We're subterranean, and yeah. we're we're putting people that are feeding right up into it. And mm-hmm. I, I I feel strongly about um, being able to change uh, culture, mm-hmm. change the the acting culture in here and the mindset, and and uh, help storytelling. Mm-hmm. Basically, you know, I, I my soapbox is always we're so heavily influenced by the Americans that we can't shake it. Right. We can't shake. The Europeans have figured out a way to to do their own thing, right? But Canada has not, Mm. right? We are Hollywood North, quote unquote. I'm doing air quotes right now. Mm. And uh, to me, that's that's not. It's not good enough. It's not cool. Super uncool. Yeah. yeah. Right. You want? I mean, what? How proud? We're such a proud nation, Mm. right? And when something comes along that is so um, purely Canadian. We go bonkers, mm-hmm. and we get, we're so proud of it, mm-hmm. right? And, and 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 I'm tired of uh, of uh, these, you know, the hotbed of of talent using whatever city they're in, Vancouver or Montreal or Toronto, especially as a stepping stone mm-hmm. to get somewhere else, right? Right? You know, mm. I'm of the same <laughs> mind for comedy. It's because yeah, because everyone's goal in comedy is to leave. Yeah. Go to the UK, go to LA, go to New York. That's the big... I mean, and if there's one... It, 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 just, it just makes me think... It, it makes me sad. It makes me think of John Candy. Right. It yeah, makes, right. It, it makes me go, well, what the fuck did those guys do for us right. if, we're, if we still have that mindset? Yeah, I, I'm, they, I'm of the same way. They I, paved the way. Yeah, and I think you know you can do it all in Canada and <laughs> totally. we, just, we just need more people to think that way and then we have a self-supporting industry. It's, it, I mean, it's the land of the future. Yeah. Isn't it? I've, don't we have everything? Hundo P. Right? And, and we have a ton of room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. Like the, 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 the yeah. I'm not going to speak badly about our American brothers to the South, but, <laughs> but um, you know, uh, carve our own thing. Mm-hmm. Make our own way. Totally. Right? Yeah. I, not, I'm, I'm all over that. No. So Fraser Studios is how many years in? Eight. Eight years. That's great. Yeah, it's wild when you stop and take a look back. And it's going well. You're happy with everything. Yeah. That's amazing. I absolutely am. It was a big deal moving to that new facility last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, like, it's, that's, that's what I had in my you know, 24-year-old mind mm-hmm. all those years ago. That's uh, amazing. And I, I, had, you know, I had to work up to it, obviously. But, uh, was your brother ever involved uh, with Fraser Studios? I thought I read something on your website about that. Yeah, well, he, uh, you know, he was responsible you know for the a lot of the business stuff at the Got beginning it. and and getting it going and mm-hmm. finding capital for us and stuff and and uh um kind of bankrolling a few things and and figuring figuring that stuff out he's a bit more in the sales and business world than i was mm-hmm. i was just an actor really at the right. time so and i learned a lot from him and, and just the experience of, of going through it and actually running it and so. he's still in toronto uh, he is, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And you, every, you're good with him and everything? We're still good, man. No, still good. It doesn't beat the shit out of me anymore. That's, that's good. Yeah, now it's good. Do you ever think back on uh, on that fateful day when your teacher said you have two paths you can go? Do you ever think of what would have happened if you'd have gone the other way? Improv and, and Vancouver and LA? Because you're a funny motherfucker. I gotta sliding, say. sliding doors. Sliding right? doors, right? That's Absolutely. Of course. I think we all do at some point, right? Yeah. You look at some of those pivotal moments in our life and you go like, man, if I had chosen you know, door number two, yeah. what, uh, what would my life be like? Who and uh, um, I try not to be a uh, grass is always greener mm-hmm. kind of guy. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with, with the way that, you know, with that choice in particular. Yeah. I mean, it, it really has set everything up. I mean, the only other thing that I can think of that could be possibly 
um, close to is if I ended up at like the Playhouse West right in LA mm-hmm. or something and even then it, it probably would have brought me back east I don't know I just it's something about that New York experience yeah and, you know, there's nothing like it there's nothing quite like it yeah. I mean I, I feel like it's it's a lot more if you simplify dumb it way down um, uh, I, I always saw LA or west as, as, as being industry driven mm-hmm. and then and, and New York uh, and the east being process driven totally and not to say that each doesn't have both but it just seems like more of a kind of forte, I guess. Yeah. It, yeah. And again, the same would apply comedy wise too. Uh, yeah. That, that's great. Well, well, man, thank you for doing this. Anything hey, you want to add? Uh, Fraserstudios.com? Uh, it's Fraserstudios.net. Dot net. <laughs> I was actually would have thought you would have gone with the CA. With the I, CA. I, I, both, so both were taken. <laughs> I, I should have researched that. I should have, I did it backwards. Who's, I should have gotten who, my domain first. Who's Fraserstudios.com? He's like an architect or something. Oh. Yeah, I know. This, this, and then dot C, I don't know. It was depressing. So I grabbed, <laughs> I grabbed dot net. I don't know. Fraserstudios.net. Any aspiring actors, uh, uh listening to this, uh, get into it. Um, take some classes at Fraser Studios. What kind of classes do you offer? Obviously, Meisner, all levels. Well, yeah, it's Meisner-based there, um, but really, uh, I have a process focus, right? So, Mm -hmm. I'm I'm working really hard to not be one of those, uh, you know, take our on-camera trick sort of uh, stuff, which I know is really appealing to a lot of you people out there, but it doesn't necessarily teach you how to act. So, Mm -hmm. or at very least, it doesn't give you a process that once you're out there working for you to draw from. And that's, that's what our forte is. And, and guys like Adrian Griffin, who I, you know, hold in in high, high regard, who uh, had the opportunity to actually study right under Sanford Meisner. Um, he's he's at our studio as well. He's a private class as well as he's part of my membership program. Same with Jonathan Higgins. He's a big uh, process guy as well. Both those guys are just absolutely outstanding acting coaches and will help in your process and give you the tools to do it yourself when mm-hmm. you get out there, um, which I feel is a big problem in, in study in Toronto in that you can only seem to do your best acting when you're acting teachers right there telling right. you what to do yeah totally right and that's i mean you know, <laughs> it doesn't really work it can't work that mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. right otherwise you're gonna be stuck in the classroom mm-hmm. the whole the whole time um but yeah a big big thing that's new that i'm proud of is the is fraser studios is offering uh memberships now which you know reduces cost there's more options uh for the auditioning actor um and uh it's a pretty cool thing in this town not a whole lot of people are doing it like a yearly membership sort of thing well you can you can sign you can try it out for a month you can do three months six months or a year so it's kind of scaled you know price wise based on on and what does that get you access to classes and coaching uh yep yeah it does so i mean it is meisner based so Mm -hmm. uh after people study uh, a certain certain way with the actual technique i i offer them you know an opportunity to sign up as a member cuts costs and it gives them (laughs) Gives them a chance to study with, you know, myself, with Adrian and Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives you some some coaching during the, during the week as well as you know scene work. And we, we're doing um, uh, around every three months. We're do, we're putting together um, sort of a master class of um, uh, of scenes where you know it's invited audience, but the work is really quite high and and um, gives uh, gives the members an opportunity to constantly have a script in their back pocket that they're working on. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's more, you know, it's more of an actor studio type right. type feel where there's, you know, it's a, we're creating a really great culture there. I'm really, really proud of it. I'm really happy to be involved. Sometimes I just feel like I'm just one of the gang yeah, there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's a great feeling to, uh, once something gets legs and starts starts totally. uh, starts doing it. Um, but yeah. That's great, man. Yeah. Thanks again. Everybody no go to Fraser Studios, FraserStudios.net. Uh, thank you, Jason Fraser, for doing this. From Jay- from Fraser Studios to Lemon Press Studios. I appreciate it, buddy. Bada boom. And watch your head. Thanks very much. Memo. And there she is, folks. Episode 21. That's a wrap on episode 21. That's right. Thanks to my guest, Jason Fraser. That was a good time. And thanks to you for listening. Always, you. I appreciate it. Thanks to my producer, Adam Fox, my sound engineer, Miles Lacroix. And, uh, oh, yeah, be sure to come out to uh, Say What 
this next Wednesday, next Wednesday, this next Wednesday, that doesn't make sense. Next Wednesday, December 3rd, got a great lineup. You find yourself in the Toronto area, come to it, 67 Front Street East. Say what for the Julian Dion Comedy Hour live show. Garage Baby will be there, of course. They're always there. And it's going to be a good one. Oh, and also, uh, once again, check out the bloopers at the end of every show. Go back. Go back a few episodes. Every episode has them. Open up an episode. Skip all the way to the end. And get a little inside on, on Lemon Press Studios, the breakdown. How we do things. A little uh, real moment. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Email the show podpod at jdcomedyhour.com. Facebook.com slash JD Comedy Hour and Twitter and Instagram at JD Comedy Hour. I think that's everything. Watch your head. Because you have something so, at one, right? Until what time do we have? Yeah, I, I just emailed him. I, I said to him, let's try to do two. So I, I haven't heard back. We'll s- I, he, he should be all right. Cool. All I right, mean, well. I'm in the driver's seat on that one, so. Well, that's good. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah, so how, how does it work? So you <laughs> put on these. How do the toys left work? Left on left, right on right. Okay, that sounds familiar. Great. Get, us, uh, get as comfortable as possible. This is yours. It's clean, fresh water. Oh, wow. Uh, I've got more here if you need it. That's great. Mine. I instantly see why everyone talks the way that they do on radio, because as soon as you have this thing on, you just want to... It's sultry, right? Yeah, it is very sultry. Can you hear yourself right now? I can hear myself incredibly well. Hey, hey. And it just makes me want to <clears throat> speak in, in low, low tones. It does, right? Yeah. Get in there. This is, uh, so welcome back to the Jack Off Hour. This is DJ <laughs> Easy Dick. Remember that? Snoop Dogg? Doggy Style? Absolutely. The original album? That was my entire uh, <laughs> junior high experience. Did you have junior high where you, yeah. where you were? How, how close do I have to be? Get as comfortable as you can, and these, these and adjust in every possible way. Bring the mic right up I'm, to you. I'm more of a... Lounge back. Yeah, like a pump yeah. kind of guy. I wish we had some beers. And then I do. Do you want one? <laughs> do you want one? It's never too early. <laughs> have that's, one. That's considered an AM ale. I gotta have my coffee first. Okay, have your just coffee. Just for you know. I, I have know. the sto- the fridge is stocked for, um, for That's amazing. Why I don't that's that's my one regret right now is why I don't I have a, a, a fridge at my studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, pull the chair next to you. Get get as comfortable as possible, and then once you're once you've found your now. optimal position, we'll bring the mic right up yeah, to your mouth. I think I'll, I think I'll, I'll lean forward. Whatever uh, makes you comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> that Amazing. Seems, that seems natural. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so let's. And then you kind of got to eat the mic. Oh, do you? Okay. Cause, cause because this is, this is optimal for me. I'm just going <laughs> to go like this. <laughs> Looks comfortable. Looks great. Um, yeah, because it's uh, a not a soundproof studio, I don't, I can't crank the gain all the way up as you would in a soundproof 
booth. Okay. Like in a soundproof booth, you can be here and, and it's fine. But in here, fine. just so I don't pick up, you know, the photo shoot that's happening right now. Right. Um, just eat the mic as much as you can. Eating it. I'll show you this every time if if you ever need to uh, eat it more a little bit. <laughs> what, what What's the... Th- we should be rolling on this. This is already gold. What's the third one? Uh, eat that <laughs> cock. No, it's just a Freudian thing, I guess. Okay. I like um, how it's crossed out. And yeah, we just sort of uh, get into it. We get to know who is Jason Fraser, the man behind don't, the man. Uh, don't pop your peas. That's all I know. Don't pop, pop your p- peas. These filters help uh, with that. Kind yeah, of these are great. These are... These look legit. High end shit. Yeah. It's very I matrixy. Did, I did go all out. Um I've been planning a podcast for three, four years maybe. Yeah. And what I noticed to what sets you apart, because everyone's got a podcast now. You were telling me, yeah. And yeah, I was telling you so sound yeah. quality is like yep. it, aside from content, sound quality and consistent release dates is what, what uh does yep. it to set yourself apart right out of the gate. Yeah. So I Kind of went all out. There you go. And how? Lo- when did you start it off? When? How long have you been doing this? This will be episode twenty-one on Friday. It's two a week, so ten and a half weeks. Okay. Okay. It's going good. Good, good for you, man. Good downloads. Good for you, and it's cool too because, I mean, I'm a big fan of bringing things to fruition. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Creating your own thing. And uh, I mean, we, we all have. Uh, so many ideas Mm -hmm. and it's one thing to have the ideas right Mm -hmm. where it sits in infamy right in your mind castle yeah but uh, it's something completely different to actually go get that board yeah and go get these things yeah and paint this little area yeah yeah totally get my ass sitting here right like it's different yeah and, and and it it surprises you mm-hmm. as well, you know what I mean? And I was a big uh, pot smoker, so that even No way. <laughs>